Hello, everyone. How's it going? Not too bad. Angelica, you okay? It looked like a tussle was going on in your camera. I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping nothing bad was happening. I'm thinking maybe you just dropped your phone or something, but <laughs> we'll make sure somebody no. has you. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm just on the way home because I just had my last class at ODU. So I'm oh. listening in before I get there. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Well, yeah, don't worry too much about the video. Make sure you drive safely. Uh, listening probably won't be too distracting, but I wouldn't want you to drive and try to watch my goofy butt. So, <laughs> uh, no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody have any questions about anything before we get started? I do, Mr. Young. So no last, I think on Tuesday, you say that the in-person test is going to be on the 24th. Uh, our lab teacher this week on Tuesday, she said that the flex day is next week on Tuesday. So I think there's some yes, that's what I discovered. I I think I initially said what, what you said, but then I looked it up or I meant to look it up. Maybe I forgot and didn't do it with you guys. But yeah, it's definitely uh, next week. So literally, I think your lab meets on Tuesday. So it's going to be on Tuesday. I think that's the 19th. So it's literally this coming Tuesday. The good news is the practice test one and practice test two have been up all this time, and it looks like a ton of people have taken them. So you're you're actually already on the way to studying for it. That shouldn't be a problem. I'm going to make another practice test because we're not – obviously, I can't test you on Tuesday on Chapter 20 when I'm just covering 20 today, even though I, I will finish all I need out of Chapter 20. So I'm going to make one that covers uh, 17, 18, 19, uh, and that will be a practice exam for test one. Uh, if you've already got, you know, let's say if you've already got one for test two, uh, I, I'm probably not going to quote unquote require you to do it, but you'd be crazy not to. Okay. So I'll do that. I've already set the date to test two was due on Monday. Uh, but I've moved it back to, I think I moved it back to Wednesday, uh, because that's the online test. So you're welcome to do that. I did get some feedback today that was a little surprising but i feel like i might be a little bit stupid for not knowing it uh i was trying to cut my online test times down and a student told me uh i've pushed the time so small that that in his estimation the students you know a student that made good grades in the previous class for instance uh but in his estimation the only way you could pass the test is by uh, cheating one on every question i didn't realize how quickly you can just cut and paste uh, a question and to Google, and then immediately the answer popped right back out thanks to Chegg and stuff like that. So I've got to reconfigure something about the online test, but that won't happen until this one. So I just, I'm probably going to extend the, the amount of time, but you see the problem that gets is then you still just have a lot of time to, to cheat. Uh, I just, you know, let you know that the way it works is, I'm giving those online tests because they're basically no foul. You can you can take them multiple times till you get a good grade, but they're really just another chance for you to do more homework. So if you're using it like that, using it to learn how to do the problems, you're going to be really good. And, and when you take the face-to-face -face test, there won't be any problem. But if you're just Googling them, yeah, you'll get good grades, but it's going to bite you in the rear when it comes to the face-to-face -face test. So just be advised. I'm not sure I can do anything different. I think I am going to extend the time to longer uh, because I really want to encourage you to try to figure it out as opposed to just looking it up. So keep that in mind, everybody. And, and like I said, you're, you're completely allowed to do it. You're not cheating uh, by using Chegg and stuff like that. That's specifically the way I made it. It's just that's sort of more gaming the system than I expected to happen. So that's that's on me. That's not your, you guys' fault. So I'm going to definitely increase the time allowed for the test in the future, but I haven't decided what else I might do. So anybody have any questions on the material? I'm actually in the process of looking up what I said about the date on the test. Let me go ahead and pull that up real quick. So yeah, now, oh good, it's not showing the date. That's super helpful. Yeah, I did change test two. That's the take-home test. I changed it to be due on September 20th. So that's Wednesday, uh, which is literally the day after your, uh, uh, in light of that, I'm going to change that. It's, it's the day after your face-to-face -face test. I don't think that'll be very nice of me. <laughs> I might get a car bomb for doing that one. So <laughs> I'm going to change that to the 24th as well. <laughs> Actually, I'll change it to the 25th. 
because you guys meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So now test two is due not on the 24th, but on the 25th at 11.59 p.m. And definitely not the 18th or 20th, which is what it was before. So now it's going to be oh. June 25th, 11.59 p.m. And the practice test, I'm making the same thing. I'm going to do that right now so I don't forget. I've I've pushed the homework for, uh, for Chapter 20 back as well. So you guys remember, don't pay attention to the dates on Canvas uh, because I, I don't put those dates in. Evidently, when it first logs in, it... Uh, it actually takes the time to uh, figure out what that date is and puts it there. So the first time that assignment ever came in, whatever date it had, that's what it was showing. And if I change it, it doesn't update in Canvas. So do not trust the uh, Canvas dates on those assignments. Uh, check in my lab and mastering by clicking on my lab and mastering on the left. And hopefully do we know, right sorry, do we know which uh, chapters the in-person test is going to be on yet? Yeah, that's what I was just telling you. I, I'm definitely doing it on 17, 18, and 19. Okay, thank you. And like I said, if you've been practicing test one, you've got two-thirds of it done. If you've done any practice on test two, you've got it all done, essentially. But I'm still going to make another practice test. That'll be practice for the face-to-face -face test, which will be called test three. So uh, that will be a little more geared straight to that test, and I'll probably make it tomorrow. That'll give you uh, plenty of time to take it. But like I said, if you've been taking the practice one test and practice two tests, you're getting plenty of work, even more than you need, and prepping for the test two. Okay. Professor? Yes, sir. Are we supposed to see our my lab and mastering grades transfer over to Canvas? Because mine are all blank. For ah, Canvas. good. Good that you mentioned that too. Let me. Uh, there's a neat way you're supposed to do this. Uh, and my student asked me that yesterday, and I realized that it did not automatically. It normally automatically uh, refreshes. It does a grade sync. And actually, it says yours, the automatic sync is on. But check this out. It didn't say that any chapters were there. <laughs> so it's been syncing nothing. So now it should show that. Well, I say now. It might it might take till tonight to show at midnight or something. But I, I think it's supposed to show within probably an hour of or two of what I'm doing. So by the end of class, I suspect you should see uh, those homeworks in there. But I love awesome. it. <laughs> no problem. Thanks for letting me know that. Uh, also, if you see any questions either on the practice test or the real test that are uh, not stuff that we covered or specifically are things that I told you you aren't re uh, required to do, let me know. That's what I discovered with my other class. So I've got to I got to make that right because evidently one of my banks got corrupted. And uh, I had some poor students that are in 202 uh, get tested on uh, a bunch of stuff that was certainly unrelated to what they've been learning. So that was not good. But anyways, anything else before we get cracking? All right. I do want you guys to look uh, at the end of class last time, which was the 12th. Uh, I told everybody on the video, though you might not have watched the video, I told everybody that I was going to write some notes about what you needed to know for the test recovering, uh, regarding Chapter 20, and I wrote them in that, those notes for uh, September 12th. So if you go to my Google Docs uh, page that's listed on your Canvas page, you can click on that and just do a search for 09122023. I'm just typing that out now. If you do a search for that, what will pop up is my is my notes from that day. And the very last page uh, has a, a reminder of what I think you should be prepared to, to do uh, on the test regarding the second law of thermodynamics and stuff like that. Uh, I'm also going to show you some of that today. So uh, it's not that big a deal if you haven't done it already. But definitely download at least those good notes from uh, from my Google Docs page. All right, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I think first I will share my screen uh, to talk about uh, Chapter 20. So I'm just going to share the screen with the textbook in it. So we're looking at Chapter 20, and Chapter 20 is called The Second Law of Thermodynamics. Here's the opening picture. 
It says relate the thermal efficiency of a heat engine to the work done and the heat absorbed by the engine. That is something that I'm going to get you to do. There's two formulas that we'll do for a Carnot engine. I'm going to give you both of those formulas and you should be able to use both of them. Uh, relate thermal efficiency of a gasoline engine to the compression ratio and ratio of heat capacities. Uh, that is really interesting, and it's a topic that I want you to learn about. So I, I definitely want you to read these sections, all of them, but I'm not going to test you on that. Uh, relate the coefficient of performance of a refrigerator to the work input. Again, I think that's perfectly fair in homeworks and maybe even practice tests by accident, but I'm not going to ask you questions on that. Relate the efficiency of a Carnot engine to the absolute temperature. That's the second formula for the Carnot engine that... Uh, I need you to be able to use. And the examples are pretty straightforward. We'll see some today. Relate the coefficient of performance of a Carno refrigerator to the absolute temperature. Again, perfectly fine for you guys to look up in your book when you're trying to do them for homework or for uh, practice tests, but I'm not going to put that on the final, I mean, on the actual face-to-face -face test or the uh, online test for chapter 20. So uh, relate the change in entropy for a thermodynamic process to the amount of heat flow and absolute temperature. I'm going to give you that formula and uh, there's a typical example you can do. I'll show you one today. Uh, other than that type of example, I don't think you're going to be doing much with it. And then finally, relate entropy to the number of possible microstates. I need you to know that formula and understand that uh, I, I'm really not, not seeing an easy way to test you on that other than by asking you conceptual questions. So uh, just pay attention to what we're doing today, and I think you'll get a, a good feel for, for what's required between that and the notes on the 9-12-2023. Uh, so everybody follow what's going on there? All right, so it turns out the second law of thermodynamics is really, really important. Let me give you an a, a idea. Your book is showing this busted coffee cup right here, and that's that's one of the archetypal examples. So uh, if you look at a problem like a coffee cup that has been knocked off of a desk and then falls and shatters and, you know, dozens of pieces or whatever, uh, and you monitor all the energy that goes into the system and out of the system, you'll find that it does not violate the first law of thermodynamics, which is really just a conservation of energy type of uh, law. So that's not violated, which it shouldn't be because it happens all the time. But here's the weird thing. If you imagine all those pieces jumping back together and becoming a full cup or a fully tacked, intact cup, and then the cup jumping back onto the desk, that's not a violation of conservation of energy either. Yet it never happens. That's why we need a second law of thermodynamics, because we see certain things happen and other things that don't happen ever. So uh, what the second law of thermodynamics does is takes a, a class of events that we've never seen and says, here's the reason that you don't see that. And uh, there's many versions of the second law of thermodynamics. And as I told you, you need to know all the versions that are listed in chapter 20 here. Uh, I'm not going to be so strict as to make sure you remember, you know, which one's the Clausius statement and what's Carnot's theorem, uh, but I, I do need you to recognize them. I would say it's nice to memorize them verbatim, uh, but I'm not going to make you write them out verbatim. It'd be more like a, a list of a bunch of laws and you identify them. So that's kind of a, a fair thing. And with that in mind, you can expect to have several of them listed for the second law of thermodynamics. So, uh, yeah, what is it that actually changes when you when you consider a cup falling off of a desk and shattering in 12 pieces versus the cup jumping together and then leaping up onto the desk? Uh, it turns out there's a, a thing we can use called entropy, and that's given the symbol S, and the entropy is actually defined such that uh, DS, uh, infinitesimal differential change in the entropy, is equal to the symbol that we used before d bar q so it's a it's a small change in q but it's not a differential because q is not a state variable it couldn't be so ds is equal to d bar q over t so you can see entropy this quantity s has units of coulombs per kelvin for instance and that's exactly right and if you calculate the entropy for that system both before and after what you would see is the entropy uh, when the cup is all together uh, sitting on the desk is uh, kind of low. And then when the cup falls off and shatters, the entropy is quite high. 
And it turns out that unless the process that you're looking at is reversible, then all processes lead to an increase in entropy, uh, at least for the for the universe, meaning there might be small parts of it that have a decrease in entropy, but there's uh, the majority of it. In other words, the complexity of it is that there's a net increase in entropy for things that happen and things that don't happen happen have either a uh, zero change in entropy, which is a reversible process, which really can't happen at all, or they have a uh, decrease in, in entropy, and that doesn't happen at all either. So that's that's the, the main idea of this. Another thing you can calculate, for instance, is uh, one of our labs, we do thermal, we do a specific heat thermal lab where we actually just take a, a chunk of metal, we put it submerged underwater, uh, since it's a metal, it's a good conductor. So, you know, once the water gets to a temperature of, say, 100 degrees Celsius, then it, a few seconds later, the entire block should be 100 degrees Celsius. That's why we use the water. And we boil the water and we leave it in there for, you know, a good minute or two after it's been boiling. And then we're fairly confident, if we can test the water at least, know that the atmospheric pressure is appropriate enough to have 100 degrees Celsius boiling point then we know the, the metal is actually 100 degrees. And then we quickly take that out, make sure there's no water on it and, and submerge it in about 50 grams of water. Normally about 50 grams of water is about twice as heavy as the uh, actual block of metal. We stick it in that uh, 50 grams of water, which also happens to be in an aluminum cup. And the aluminum cup uh, is part of the system. And then it's isolated from the rest of the system by a calorimeter. When we do that, we normally start off with the water and the inner cup being at about 20 degrees Celsius. And of course, the metal block being about 100 degrees Celsius. And because the specific heat of water is so high, when you stick the block in there and then you stir it to make sure you know all the water gets a chance to touch it instead of just uh, sort of boiling away in little micro bubbles or whatever, uh, then what happens is uh, the water temperature might go from 20 degrees Celsius to 22 and the metal block will go from 100 degrees Celsius to 22 as well. So they actually e reach equilibrium. And what you're doing is you watch the temperature as that's happening and the temperature will climb, 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 climb. And then it'll come to a stop. And if you wait long enough, it'll actually start to go back down. That peak of temperature was the point at which the block of metal the water in the aluminum cup and the aluminum cup itself, the inner aluminum cup itself, were all at equilibrium at that temperature. And that's the final temperature, let's say 23 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now here's the neat part. I could have stuck that 100 degrees Celsius chunk of metal into the, the water. And what could have happened is the water could have gone from 20 degrees Celsius, the water in the cup would go instead to 17 degrees Celsius. And that would actually allow the uh, block of metal to go up to 103 degrees Celsius. And that works from a calorimetry standpoint, meaning if you solve the calorimetry problem of a, a, a metal block going from 100 degrees Celsius to 103, that would be exactly the amount of energy needed to make the water go from 20 to 17. So again, that's a case where the first law of thermodynamics not being violated, yet that does not happen. And again, if you did the calculation of that ds, which is delta q over t or d bar q over t, for that process, you'd see that one of them is a is a entropy increase, specifically the one that happens, the water getting warmer. And when you do the same process for the water getting colder, you find that the entropy decreases, and therefore you know it doesn't happen. Anybody have any questions on that? So that's sort of my attempt at uh, foreshadowing this version of the second law of thermodynamics. This is the first version in the book, and it's due to R.J.E. Clausius, who lived from 1822 to 1888. Uh, it says that heat can flow spontaneously from a hot object to a cold object. Heat will not flow spontaneously from a cold object to a hot object. So that second scenario where I was taking the hot block and stick it in the water me suggesting that the water is going to give some heat to the block to make it 103 and to bring the water and cup down to 17, that is a, a direct contradiction to the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics. 
So this is the first version of the second law of thermodynamics that you've seen. Any questions on that one? Again, I don't care that you memorize that that version is a Clausius statement, but I do care that you memorize that that one. Okay. And I could say it, I could actually stop it at the semicolon if I wanted and just say heat can flow spontaneously from a hot object to a cold object. Uh, and then by, you know, uh, you looking at them saying that probably suggests that it can't go the other way. Uh, but it's nice that they took the time to go ahead and explain it the other way and say, no, it's not going to do it spontaneously. And spontaneous means basically it's going to do it on its own. Uh, you can uh, take heat from a hot, I mean, from a cold object and put it into a hot object, but to do so uh, requires extra energy. So for instance, uh, the inside of your house is quite cool compared to the outside of your house in the summer, but your air conditioner is charged with the job of taking heat out of the, you know, let's say 74 degrees Celsius uh, or degree Fahrenheit uh, living room of your house and putting that outside to the 95 degree outside environment. Now, uh, it's not a direct one-to-one -one thing. So for every you know, calorie you take out of the air in your house, uh, you're actually probably spending 10 calories or something god awful like that. But what's happening is you know, two or three calories or whatever, leaving your house going to the outside and you're taking, uh, basically paying for more than that two calories by paying the electric bill. Similarly, uh, air conditioning or the cold air in a, in a refrigerator can have heat taken from it and uh, basically produced out into the, into the uh, kitchen. And that is, again, something that the electric company charges you for because it takes some energy to do that. So that's one of the ways... Uh, uh, that we can describe uh, something that's not not spontaneous, uh, not spontaneous. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the second section just to show you where we're going on this. So this is a heat engine. We picture it as sort of a, a, a black box. There's this you know green box right here. Uh, we I would call it a black box. So it's in this diagram, you really don't know what it's doing, right? All you know is that some heat is coming in from a high temperature reservoir. reservoir. Uh, and that engine is causing some of that heat to turn into work that can be, you know, made useful. It could be, for instance, a car engine causing your engine to, or causing your car to go. But then part of that heat that you put in is actually going to go to waste. It's going to be QL and it's going to leave the engine and be injected into a low temperature reservoir. So we're talking about these, uh, heat sinks, and reservoirs that's sort of like I told you before about like a lake. A lake is a is a heat reservoir in the sense that you know you can get a hundred or even a thousand people in a lake, and all of their body temperatures are ninety eight point six, and some fraction of them are even going to you know urinate in the pond or the lake. But the lake is not going to warm up. It's not going to change its temperature except you know locally right around the person that that you know peed or right around the person that's just sitting there. So that's that's actually a heat sink, meaning you can keep, put as much heat as you want into there and it's big enough that it's going to cover it. Now, if you were talking, you know, seven billion people uh, and the lake is not that big, then maybe that's not a good heat reservoir. And that's a real concern. But what I'm saying is for any given problem, you just choose a heat reservoir that's big enough so that its temperature doesn't change just by you pulling heat out of it or putting heat into it. So this is the classic diagram for a heat engine. It's a it's an engine that takes in a certain amount of heat, QH, spits out a certain amount of work, W, and then of course you know QH has to be equal to W plus QL, and then the QL is going to be a exhaust gas. You're losing some of it. And the way I like to think of this is whenever you have energy converted to heat, like in the case of QH, that's a heat. Uh, it's sort of a bastardized version of heat. So you have no ability to get all of it to do stuff for you. Uh, it's You can imagine it like herding cats, or you can just think about the microscopic model of it. Really what, what this heat is, when it's flowing from a high temperature object to a cold temperature object, the high temperature object has a bunch of atoms or molecules moving with a high kinetic energy. That's the definition of high temperature. They're bumping into something uh, with atoms or molecules that are a low kinetic energy because they're low temperature, and that's the definition of low temperature. 
Now, uh, what's going to happen is a certain chunk of those molecules or atoms are going to run into the, the high kinetic energy molecules and atoms, and they're going to leave those collisions with more kinetic energy. And they might get knocked away so far that some other atoms and molecules come in to interact with the with the molecules with the high kinetic energy. Uh, and eventually what's going to happen is all of the molecules in the colder body will have uh, their net kinetic energy increase instead of having like a bimodal distribution where you got, you know, uh, 10 to the 10th atoms and molecules have a really huge kinetic energy. And then the other 10 to the tw uh, 12th or 10 to the 14th have, you know, a low kinetic energy. That's not an equilibrium state. What you really want is basically a smooth uh, bell curve type distribution of the uh, atomic or of the kinetic energies of the atoms and molecules. Once that happens and you get that sort of bell curve looking distribution of kinetic energies in the cold object and the average is comparable or equal to the average kinetic energy in the hot object, then they're by definition the same temperature and they've reached equilibrium. So that's really what happens when heat is transferred from a hot object to a cold object. So imagine the detail and, and uh, low probability uh, required for you to go in and say, okay, you atom number one out of 10 to the 26th of you guys, I want you to give me back exactly the amount of energy that you got. Okay, I'm going to put it over here. And I'm going to do that with a second atom. It's just very, very unlikely. So once you've converted energy into uh, heat like that, you've you've sort of tainted it in such a way that it's not going to be able to do as good as it uh, did in the past. Oh, I just realized I have a typo on my uh, video. So it's not in, in that sense, you can think of heat as a bastardized form of energy. And anytime you convert uh, energy to heat, some of it's going to be lost, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So that's a typical diagram of a, of a heat engine. I'm going to talk about efficiency of the heat engine. And uh, you can read about this and, and see exactly how they compare. But the Carnot cycle uh, is the one I'm going to go over. And it's related to this engine right here that you see. The top one's a steam turbine. And a steam turbine is essentially how we get power from just about any power source uh, other than other than solar so, uh, and, and uh, wind, for that matter. Solar and wind, uh, they do not use steam turbines. Uh, they could use a turbine type device, basically, like with a windmill. You, you need something that has the ability to, to turn rotations into energy. So you could just basically connect those propellers uh, to a set of, of magnets and then have them rotate inside of another magnetic field and that would generate electricity. So you can do that, that's straightforward. And, and that that sort of uh, battery, or excuse me, that sort of magnet sitting inside of a bunch of other magnets and spinning, that is basically what the steam turbine does, except the steam turbine has steam causing the, the blades to turn and turn the magnets, so. Uh, we're going to compare it more towards that engine that you see down there at the bottom. So uh, you can refer back to that at any point. Uh, this is in section 2 dash or 20 dash 2 dash 1 of your textbook. So I'm going to stop sharing this version and go ahead and share uh, my iPad. Look at me remembering stuff and not writing on my iPad without you knowing, <laughs> without you being able to see it. I've become a real teacher. Woo, sort of. <laughs> Anybody have any questions so far on anything? All right, so uh, it's in the process of trying to show on your screen. Uh, what I'm going to do is I've already uh, typed in the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics. I was going to type them all in, but it turns out it's slow and pain in the butt to type them in, so I'm not going to do it. I tried to cut and paste from my Pearson thing, and uh, Pearson uh, has got it set up where you can't cut and paste anything from the textbook. So uh, basically, I typed that one, and I said that's good enough. So I've got the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics up there. Uh, again, what I mentioned was a heat engine was a heat reservoir. Let's actually let's make the color a little bit more reasonable. So this is a heat reservoir, a heat sink's another word for it, and uh, it has a temperature T high, and it's going to put in, let's say, 
some heat. And I, I usually draw my engine as a circle or something resembling a circle. <laughs> That's actually a horrible version of a circle. So I normally draw it like this. Look at that perfect circle I made. Hmm, Mr. Younger is smart and talented. <laughs> All right. And then out pops a pipe over here that is work. And in here is a heat Q hot, meaning it's coming from the hot side. And then coming out of here is hopefully a much smaller amount of heat. And it's going into a colder reservoir. So this is temperature T low. And that's Q low going this way. And this object is the heat engine. Okay, now the efficiency of a heat engine is equal to what you get divided by what you pay for. That's a nice mnemonic that I use. And you can see that according to this heat engine, the part that you get that's really useful is the work. So that's going to mean work is in the numerator. But what you pay for is all that heat you took out of the hot reservoir. So that's QH here. So that is the efficiency. And that's the efe efficiency of a heat engine. OK, now you can also simplify that because part of this, you should be able to see that Q heat is the total amount of energy coming in. And therefore, it has to be equal to W plus QL. So you can also rewrite this as E is equal to W over. And now we'll replace uh, QH with W over QL or excuse me, W plus QL, like that. And that works as well. So, uh, yeah, QLO was Q, oops, sorry. So QH is W plus QL. So this, oh yeah, that was right. Sorry, I was solving for the other part. So now what you can also realize is that W is in fact QH minus QL, and then you could leave that all over QH. So this is another form you could get, but the one that I think uh, is a little more uh, most handy is this version where you end up getting one minus QL over QH. So in my estimation, this version and this version are the most useful. but they both apply. Okay, so that's some stuff you can use. Uh, what we're going to do, and this is part of what chapter 19 was about, was showing you those neat things like the adiabatic processes and the isothermal processes and all that kind of stuff. All of that was allowing us to uh, basically reach a formula that uh, we can use to simplify the formula for the efficiency of a Carnot engine. And your book handles a Carnot engine and the auto uh, cycle, O-T-T-O, not A-U-T-O. Uh, it handles both of those. And I will relate this Carnot engine, for instance, to a uh, to an actual four-stroke gas engine uh, in a second. But let's go ahead and start off with looking at the Carnot engine. So with the Carnot engine... what we're going to do is first off, we're going to imagine that it's basically frictionless. Okay. So that's a, a really <laughs> uh, extremely nice thing to have and it's impossible. Right. But because of it being frictionless, all the processes are reversible. Now, if you don't see a link between reversibility and friction, 
uh, try to think of it this way. Uh, when you took 241, especially if you took it under me, you can think of, you know, someone firing a bullet in the air uh, is not a not a safe thing. You know, shooting a bullet straight up in the air is not necessarily a safe thing because if you ignore air resistance, what you know is going to happen is the bullet will leave the barrel of the gun, handgun, rifle, whatever it is, at some, you know, speed greater than the speed of sound, usually, uh, in, in a lot of cases anyways. It's going to go up and slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, until it gets to the very top of its motion, at which point it's then going to begin to fall, 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 and speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up. And if there's no air resistance, then when it gets back to the exact same height as you fired it, it's going to be going the exact same speed. Now we know there is actually air resistance, but still, would you would you want a, a air filled uh, plastic life preserver to be used as a uh, bulletproof vest? That's more or less what you're asking for if you think it's going to be safe to shoot a bullet straight up in the air, and 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 if it hits you, it's going to be slowed down by the air. So uh, if you think about that, how it actually would be, be able to go exactly the same speed when it came back. Uh, that's because it, it was only dealing with conservative forces and conservative forces are those ones that, uh, for instance, I told my students about that you can take this uh, differential operator and take the cross product of it with the force. And if it's identically zero, it's a conservative force, uh, which means that basically it has no friction, but you can always go back to the same state. So in other words, the bullet can leave at, you know, 350 meters per second. And then when it gets back to the uh, same height, it'll be going 350 meters per second. If you actually do that with a frictionful situation, then when the bullet gets back, it will not be in the same state it was when it left. And, and that's sort of the idea that you, you can't be reversible because on the reverse, it, it should have come back to exactly the same state it was and it wasn't. So in order for us to have a, a cyclic engine, we actually need it to go from some state, do some stuff, blah, 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 but then come back to that exact same state. Uh, if it's not back at that exact, exact same state, then I'm not going to be able to repeat the process over and over in a cyclic way like you would do a heat engine. So that's a way that you can sort of imagine in your mind that uh, reversibility has something to do with friction. So with, the, uh, with Carnot's engine, uh, basically, what he decided was, uh, let's do a, a pressure versus volume graph. Okay. And this part right here is the volume. And this part right here is the pressure. And we're going to start off at point A, say. And we're going to go to, let's say, point B. And then that's going to go to point C. And then that's going to come back to point D like this. So I'm going to call this A, B, C, and D. Okay. Now what's actually happening here is this process. happens at a constant temperature TH, and this process happens at a constant temperature T low. Now this process here, that's an adiabatic process. as is this one. Now, this one at the top, the A to B and the C to D, those are actually isotherms. Let me let me make this word adiabatic a little better. That doesn't look so good. Okay.
So those two processes are adiabatic. This top process, you can see it's at a fixed temperature, so it's actually isothermal. as is this one down here. And what happens at this point in time is heat QH comes in. And what happens at this point in time is a heat QL goes out. So that's the Carnot engine. You can see basically an isothermal expansion from A to B, followed by an adiabatic expansion. Notice the volume's increasing each time uh, from B to C. Then it starts to turn back, and uh, there's an isothermal process in which QL is released into the environment, and that goes from C to D. And then from D to A is another adiabatic process uh, from D to A, and then it starts all over. So you can sort of think of uh, the piston basically uh, having already had the fuel injected through the, uh, through the input valves. The fuel's already in the piston and the piston basically is pushed down in that first part from A to B at, by an explosion. So if it's a gas engine, what that means is uh, there was a compression and then at the peak of compression, the spark plug fired and caused it to ignite and it exploded and pushed the piston down so fast that the temperature really couldn't change. Uh, you know, temperature is a slow process changing temperature because you've got to have all the molecules bumping against all the other molecules and then all reaching equilibrium. So it's kind of slow. So that's why that first part's adiabatic, I mean, isothermal, uh, because the temperature just can't change that quickly. It explodes and pushes the piston down. That's that's your power stroke portion. That's what's going to go and deliver energy to the crankshaft. That's going to turn the transmission. That'll turn the uh, the hogshead. That turns the axle and ultimately turns the wheel. Uh, but it continues to expand a little bit more in the adiabatic process, and then it starts to compress again. This time, it's getting its power from the other pistons. Uh, pushing the crankshaft and that crankshaft now pushing the piston back up. And as the piston's going back up, it's actually letting out some of the exhaust through the, through the exhaust ports. And then once it finishes compressing, uh, the, the exhaust port closes and the input port opens again, fuel starts to fill up and we start the process at A over again. So that's a, basically a four stroke engine. The only difference between it with a, with it in a gas engine and comparing that to a diesel engine is a diesel engine doesn't have spark plugs because the, the compression ratio is so high that the gas explodes just from the, the heat and the high pressure. So it's, I think the last time I looked, uh, compression ratios for gas engines are on the order of two or three to one, whereas the compression ratio for a diesel engine is like seven or eight to one. So uh, that's that's a big difference. And in, in that sense, it's a little bit more efficient. You don't need the electricity. You're just compressing it so much. Uh, and it's a little diesels are generally a little more hardy. But anyways, that's the Carnot engine. And if I introduce that thing I told you about earlier, the entropy, one way I can entropy, uh, one day I can introduce it is delta S is equal to delta Q over T which I wrote earlier and said earlier that it's D bar Q over T. Both are sort of acceptable, uh, but what I want you to understand is if a process is reversible, then delta S is equal to zero. That means basically uh, S is equal to a constant. OK, so if you say S is equal to a constant, you can sort of say that QH over TH is equal to Q low over T low. And that gives us that Q low over Q high is equal to T low over T high. 
So now the Carnot efficiency, which was one minus QL over QH, can be replaced with one minus TL over TH. So that's a quick and dirty way of, of arguing that the efficiency is that second version you see there. And that's what we're going to use. Now, uh, it's not it's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it's, it's a decent way and it's, it's an accurate way. But the way your book did it is it didn't want to introduce entropy yet. So they wanted you to see that you can do it just from the ideal gas laws. So what they ended up using to get there was uh, P1 V1 to the gamma power is equal to P2 V2 to the gamma power. And then they use, uh, that's for adiabatic. So that's for the adiabatic processes. And they also used work is equal to the integral of PDV, which becomes NRT ln V2 over V1. Uh, that's true for isothermal. So they used those two expressions and, and a little bit of work and came up with the same result. But I showed it to you was just using entropy. So that's kind of nice. So uh, that is the formula that you need to use uh, more consistently. So let's let's look at a particular problem, for instance. So uh, let's say a car engine. A car engine has an uh, is twenty percent efficient, and produces about let's say uh, twenty five kilojoules per cycle. Actually, I should probably say the work part first. 25 kilojoules of, oops. So it produces 25 kilojoules of work per cycle. What we'd like to know is uh, A, what heat input is required and B, uh, how much heat is wasted. Okay, so everybody understand the problem? So we are actually given heat here. So it, that tells me that we can use our formula E is equal to work over QH, right? That's one of the ver uh, versions of efficiency. And because we have that, we can now say 0 0.20 is equal to 25 kilojoules over QH, and that gives me QH is equal to 25 kilojoules divided by 0 0.20. Now that's two tenths, so uh, basically what that means is uh, two tenths is two over 10, so you can put a 10 in the numerator and a two in the denominator, so that becomes 250 kilojoules divided by 10 uh, or excuse me, divided by two, which is uh, 125 kilojoules. So that's how much heat is actually has to be put into the engine if it's 20% efficient so that it can make 25 kilojoules of work. Now, part B, we want to know uh, what is QL. So to do that, what we realize is QH is equal to W plus QL, as I told you from that diagram. Remember, you, you should be able to 
figure out this formula QH equals W plus QL just from looking at the uh, heat engine diagram. See, the only thing coming in is QH and what's going out is W and QL. So that's not something new that you got to make up. That's just what you know. So now all I need to do is say QL has got to equal QH minus W. And of course, QH is 125 kilojoules and uh, W is 25 kilojoules. So basically this one is wasting 100 kilojoules. Any questions on that? So uh, that's just a typical example. Uh, I'll just call it example. Like that. All right. So now we can do the same thing uh, using the Carnot, the new version of the Carnot efficiency. And I'll tell you Carnot's theorem, which isn't, it isn't a second law of thermodynamics, but it's a step towards getting another version of the second law of thermodynamics. The Carnot's theorem says all reversible engines, remember I said the Carnot engine is supposed to be reversible, which is uh, partly uh, can be thought of as conservation or excuse me, frictionless. But it really means that it's a series of states that are only infinitesimally different from an equilibrium state. So if you imagine a, a, a gas inside of a cylinder with a piston on top of it, that gas might be at you know 400 Kelvin. And what we're saying is uh, it's not going to jump from 400 Kelvin to 800 Kelvin. It's going to jump from 400 Kelvin to 400.1 Kelvin. And that way, it's only an infinitesimal amount away from the 400 Kelvin state, but it's also only an infinitesimal amount away from the 401 Kelvin state, both of which you can sort of pretend like are equilibrium states. So you sort of imagine it as a very slow process, so everything works out perfectly. Uh, you can turn it around at any time and start going backwards. That's where the reversibility comes in and the fact that uh, it's cyclic so that you end up starting on A and ending on A. So that's really where it is. But now that we have that, uh, what we what we were saying is Carnot's theorem says all reversible engines operating between the same two constant temperatures, TH and TL, have the same efficiency. So yes, there are other heat engines. There's Carnot engine, there's a Stirling engine, there's an auto cycle. Uh, I, think, I can't remember one of the other ones. There, I, I've learned about five of them uh, in my life studying physics uh but like i said there's there's several of them and in fact you can see now there there used to be a sterling and i don't know they might still sell it but dodge trucks make a sterling version of a diesel uh which is neat because the you know uh dodge trucks actually use cummins diesel which in my opinion is one of the better diesels that exist uh but they have a sterling version which is a descendant of the sterling uh idea of the sterling engine so anyways that's kind of neat so any reversible engine, irreversible engine operating between the same two fixed temperatures will have an efficiency that's less than the reversible engine. So what Carnot says is, hey, all those other engines, uh, if they operate between TH and TL, then they're all going to have the same efficiency, one minus TL over TH. And guess what? If you find any other real engine, then obviously it's not reversible and all irreversible engines have less efficiency than a reversible engine. So here's another example. Let's say, uh, let's say, uh, an engine operates, whoa, oh, Nelly. between 500 degrees Celsius, oops, and 265 degrees Celsius. What is the maximum efficiency 
Und of this engine. Okay. So solution. Now, the reasoning here, remember, this is uh, often the case in physics classes. The words I'm saying is way more important than the stuff I'm writing down, uh, partly because the stuff I'm writing down, you can always look at because you've got the, the Google Docs available to you. Plus, I do examples that are often similar to the ones in the book. So you've got the book to look at as well for the, the stuff. But you also have the words to read in the book, too. So that's helpful. But in this case, I want you to realize what we're asked here is what's the maximum efficiency. And what we just learned was the Carnot theorem. And Carnot said that uh, all reversible engines operating between a certain temperature, uh, between two certain temperatures, TH and TL, have the same efficiency. And all irreversible engines will be less efficient than that. So the best case scenario is these two temperatures uh, could be used to calculate uh, efficiency of a reversible engine and you know that that is not only the maximum, it's actually an un untainable, unattainable maximum. So I'm going to say the efficiency that they're looking for is actually less than 1 minus TL over T hot. And I put the less than symbol because I want you to understand that the maximum is what a reversible engine does. And Carnot's theorem says, no, you're not getting there. So I just put less than. So it'll be one minus. Now, here's the key thing is you have to use these temperatures in Kelvin. So you can't just go willy nilly using Celsius or Fahrenheit. You have to use Kelvin. So in using Kelvin, T low is 265. Converting that to Kelvin, I got to add 273. So that'd be 400, uh, 530, 538. So 538 is T low. Hopefully I did my arithmetic correctly. And T high is 500 plus 273. So that'd be 773 Kelvin. And when I do this calculation, I get one minus parentheses, five, well, actually, let me go ahead and, let me go ahead and put in the uh, full math. I want to say 265 plus 273. And I'll put all that in parentheses. That way, even if I did make a mistake, uh, it, it will fix it. So 275 or 265 plus 273 in parentheses divided by parenthesis 500. This one I know I added right, plus 273, close parenthesis, close parenthesis. And I got 0 0.3040 0 is the efficiency. Uh, really, 538 divided by 773, that gives me 0.695, and that's three sig figs, so I'm really supposed to go to three sig figs, which means that digit right there is insignificant, okay? The one is to an infinite number of significant figures. So everybody understand that question? Anybody have any questions on that one? So here's another example that's kind of nice. And uh, this is, you know, part of, of what we can use as physicists to, uh, you know, make sure people aren't shaking other people down or make sure someone's not missing something major. Uh, for instance, one of the versions of the second law of thermodynamics uh, not one that's mentioned in your book, by the way, is basically you can't make a perpetual motion machine, okay? And you can see a lot of things that look like they're perpetual motion machines. One I've seen on YouTube, for instance, was someone took the time to lace a bicycle wheel, not with spokes, but with rubber bands. And rubber bands are awesome uh, in physics, specifically because some researchers uh, took time to actually figure out what the equation of state for a rubber band is. So we actually literally have like a PV equals NRT type version of equation of state, but it's for a actual rubber band. So we know it behaves very specific. Well, we know very specific things about the way it behaves. But what this person did was took a bicycle wheel, laced it up with rubber bands instead of instead of spokes. 
and then you know set it up on a pair of forks like you would on a bike and then they just shined a light on the actual rubber band spokes and it like started going woo, 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 and like started going faster and faster and faster it looks like a perpetual motion machine okay well if you think about the uh equation of state what we learn is that uh unlike most things uh rubber bands behave quite differently when you heat them up and what's happening is that light is supplying a good amount of energy into it so it's not a violation of energy of conservation of energy and uh the fact that it'll of course eventually uh, wear out and all sorts of stuff like that uh tells it's not not really a perpetual motion machine it's a temporary motion machine but you can discern where all the energy is coming from so our knowledge of thermodynamics can uh, keep us from being tricked by stuff like that. And here's an example. Let's say, uh, example. Elmo Muskie. Comes to you. with an investment opportunity. He claims to have created an engine that uses 11 point oops 11.5 kilojoules of heat at 450 Kelvin, and I'm assuming that's three sig figs, and that the exhaust heat is 3.8 kilojoules. at 281 Kelvin. Do you believe him? Okay. Everybody understand the problem we got here? So we've got a couple formulas for efficiency and the efficiency for a heat engine period is basically uh, what I told you before. E is equal to what you get divided by what you pay for. OK, so what he's saying is this efficiency is actually. Oh, and by the way, uh, since QH is equal to W plus QL then W is equal to QH minus QL. So I'll say QH minus QL over QH. So we can now calculate the efficiency of this engine. And he says the, uh, the engine uses 11.5 kilojoules of heat. So that's the heat input, 11.5 kilojoules. And it actually expels or exhausts 3.8 kilojoules. And of course, that's divided by Q sub H again. And I don't know why I wrote all that in blue, but I did. So here we are, 11.5 kilojoules. So when I do this math, I get that the efficiency E of the engine at least the claim of the efficiency of the engine is 11.5 minus 3.8. That's 7.7 .7 kilojoules over 11.5 kilojoules. 
And that gives me, excuse me, 0 0.6695. Okay, that's the efficiency that this engine claiming. That's really a high efficiency, by the way. Human body is closer to 20% and cars are closer to 20%, maybe on the low side. Steam turbines can can get pretty high efficiencies, but I don't I don't think they're even approaching 50% now. So I would I would be skeptical of that efficiency right from the get-go, uh, just with the limited experience I have from you know reading and stuff. Uh, but now let's compare that to the Carnot efficiency because we know for a fact if it's more efficient than the Carnot engine, then it can't be real. So now we'll check the Carnot engine efficiency. So E Carno. And remember, according to Carno's theorem, that's the efficiency of any reversible engine. So I'm going to say one minus. Now the temperature uh, in the low case is 281 Kelvin. And the temperature in the high case is 450 Kelvin. So we get 281 divided by 450. And that gives us 1 minus 0 0.6244. A lot of extra sig figs there. Obviously, this one's two extra sig figs over there. And now I'm going to do 1 minus that. And that gives me 0 0.3756. So uh, the efficiency of a Carnot engine between those two temperatures is actually 0 0.3756, which is less than the efficiency claimed. So we claim it's BS. Any questions on that? So at this point in the book, uh, they bring up another, they, we've already talked about the Carnot theorem and the Carnot theorem, like I said, is a, is a first step in, in making a new version of the second law of thermodynamics. And now I'm going to give you the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Again, you can find this in your book and that's what you want to do because you need to go through chapter 20, find all the versions of the second law of thermodynamics and, and write them down and memorize them for the test. Uh, not necessarily for the online, to, I mean, for the face-to-face -face test, because I'm not going to be able to cover Chapter 20 on that. That's not fair to you guys. So uh, the second law of thermodynamics, according to the Kelvin-Planck statement, is no device is possible whose sole effect is to transform a given amount of work or a given amount of heat completely into work. So no device is possible whose sole effect is to transform a given amount of heat completely into work. Now, in diagram form, this is what the Kelvin-Planck statement says. The Kelvin Planck statement basically says if this is your heat reservoir and this is your heat engine, QH is coming in. And W is coming out. But that's it. So what we say here is this is, oh, that's a terrible looking mark. Never mind. Not possible.
So there's no such an engine where you can just draw heat and turn 100% of it into work. It just doesn't happen. So again, that's another uh, another way of thinking about that would be that heat is a bastardized version of energy so that you can't really use all of it in a helpful way. So uh, hopefully that'll uh, help you remember that diagram is not possible. And that should be able to help you remember the second law of thermodynamics in, in the Kelvin Planck version. Uh, your book does talk about a third law of thermodynamics uh, in section 2010 and actually a little bit before that too. Uh, so uh, you might want to check that out just to be in the know. You also should know, of course, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, uh, which we talked about some time ago. So anybody have any questions on that? Your book does cover the auto cycle and the difference between the auto cycle and the uh, and the uh, Carnot cycle is the auto cycle actually has two, uh, you know, where we have an adiabatic process on the right side and the left side in the Carnot engine, like the two blue lines, they're adiabatic. With the auto cycle, OTTO cycle, you actually have the left and right side of that diagram are actually isovolumetric. So they're vertical lines on the P versus V graph. And then the uh, the top, which would be like from A to B in our diagram, the top and the bottom, which would be like from B to B to C uh, in our diagram, those are actually going to be uh, adiabatic processes. So that's really what the auto cycle does. Again, it's it's worthwhile. I would say definitely read it. See if you can follow that example. See if you can regurgitate that example. So you'll have a better understanding of thermodynamics and heat engines in general. Uh, and that's a really good thing, but I'm not going to test you on it, okay? I just want you to know it uh, because of that. It then goes in, in your book, in section 24, it goes into refrigerators, air conditioners, and heat pumps. And what I want you to do is uh, know basically what the efficiency of a refrigerator is. And the efficiency of a refri refrigerator is, is the same thing as the efficiency of a air conditioner. Basically, it's a... It's a uh, Carno or a heat engine running backwards. So what we do when we picture a refrigerator or something like that is we picture a certain amount of work coming in. And uh, what we're trying to do is actually suck the heat out of the cold reservoir and put it into the warm reservoir. So in that vein, look at this. This will be a... Uh, AC or refrigerator. And they normally talk about, uh, instead of talking about, say, efficiency, they sometimes use like coefficients of performance. And that's really what we're talking about here. So the coefficient of performance for a, a for an air conditioner or a refrigerator really is this, the symbol they use is COP. And uh, the diagram we use for it basically looks like the diagram for the Carno, but the arrows are a little jacked up. So we have a temperature TH in the hot reservoir. Uh, we have a refrigerator. We have a ability to push some heat that way. We've got an ability to pull some work in this way. And uh, we're going to push out some heat QH that way. And what the ultimate result is, is we're taking this cold reservoir at T low and we're sucking from it an amount of heat Q low. So that's the diagram for an AC or a refrigerator. Let me make this look a little better. And then the coefficient of performance, again, is what you get divided by what you pay for. Well, what you get is actually the, the Q low, the heat that you're pulling out of the room is really what you get. So you put, oops. So you put QL on the top, and then what you're paying for is actually the W. 
So that's the coefficient of performance for those. I, I am perfectly okay with you doing all sorts of cool problems with this in your homework and in your uh, practice tests. On the test, I can expect maybe uh, a very simple, straightforward example where I give you the heats and the temperatures and stuff like that and just ask you to calculate a coefficient of performance, but I doubt I'll even do that, okay? If you wanna see an example to help you, they're really straightforward, but see example in your book, uh, 20-5. So that's, that's the caliber of problem that I would ask you to do on the test, if I'm gonna do that on the test at all, so. That's like the hardest problem. regarding or tests. That's really, like I said, we, we don't have normally cover chapter 20 and 242. I just don't think it's okay to go through a thermodynamics portion of a course without covering the second law of thermodynamics, so I don't do that. Uh, don't even worry about the heat pump. You can ignore that, uh, but the heat pump is sort of similarly designed uh, but what we do get from all of this is yet another version of the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, this is another Clausius statement. It says, no device is possible whose sole effect is to transfer heat from one region at temperature TL into a second region at, at higher temperature TH. So that's another version of the second law of thermodynamics. You can see it sounds just like the original Clausius statement. So that's cool too. But the main thing is I just want to make sure you knew that. So uh, that's all you really need to know as far as the efficiency stuff and coefficient of performance. Your book does take the time to learn, uh, uh, to teach you about the SEER rating. I don't know if you guys are old enough to be uh, having worked in HVAC or to have bought a house or, or done any uh, heavy problems with the uh, air conditioning unit. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is what HVAC stands for. But one of the figures they use in the mar in the industry now is SEER, S-E-E-R, and your book takes time to explain that. The SEER is basically the heat removed in BTU divided by the electrical input in watt hours. Watt hours is just energy. So because remember, watt is like joule per second, and an hour is a unit of time, so it cancels out the seconds. So that's what the SEER rating is. Your book does, time, uh, does explain that to you, so that's kind of helpful. So uh, what I'm going to do now is just tell you again about entropy. So I've already given you a little bit of a, a primer on entropy in general. We know, for instance, that entropy, here's another way of writing it. Notice it looks a little different from the way I wrote before, but delta S can also be equal to Q over T. In other words, I sometimes use delta Q, but pretty much your book never uses delta Q. So... Because it doesn't, it honestly, it really doesn't make much sense to talk about delta Q. But I guess when I first encountered physics, I saw the phrase delta Q one time and I, I sort of remembered it. But book, the book doesn't use it. So that's another version of uh, entropy. As I said, the units of entropy are the units of Q divided by the units of T, which is coulombs per Kelvin. Or excuse me, coulombs, stupid idiot. I was just thinking to tell you, make sure you tell them that's not Q for charge. And I wrote charge on there. So <laughs> let's say joules per Kelvin. <laughs> that's really what it is, okay? And the sign convention is just like the sign convention that we had in the second law or in the first law of thermodynamics. Q positive is when heat is added to the system. Q negative is when heat is taken away from the system. Uh, work being positive is work done by the system and work being negative is work done on the system. Uh, your book does a nice example. I'm going to tell you to see example 20-7. 
And that's basically one where an ice cube of mass 56 grams is taken from a storage compartment at zero degrees Celsius and placed in a paper cup. After a few minutes, exactly half the mass of the ice cube has melted, becoming zero degrees Celsius water. Find the change in entropy of the 56 grams of, of ice water. So uh, really, that's just an easy application of Q equals M times L because it's a change of state. It didn't even change temperatures. So you're going to take the half of the 56 grams, which would be, what, 28 grams? You're going to make uh, make that into kilograms and multiply it by the latent heat, which uh, for ice is 333 kilojoules per kilogram. So you're going to multiply 0 0.028 times 333 kilojoules per kilogram, and that gives you 9.3 kilojoules. Now, the temperature did remain constant, so you're going to divide that by 273 Kelvin, and you'll end up getting delta S is 34 uh, joules per Kelvin. That's simple, but it is an increase, and that's the key thing to understand. The entropy change uh, in melting that was something that naturally occurs because it was an entropy increase. So, uh, as I told you, reversible processes have entropy not change. And uh, your book does some uh, work in showing you that the uh, entropy is a state variable. Again, that's wonderful stuff. I highly recommend you read it. I definitely recommend you try to learn it and understand it and be able to you know, do the calculations and do the examples they do, but I'm not going to ask them of you. The last thing I want to show you in this is there's a neat version of the second law of thermodynamics uh, that involves microstates. And the actual equation that's used for that is the entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant, which sometimes I subscript with a B, times the ln of W, like this, where W is the number of microstates in a macrostate. So uh, basically, if you think about throwing uh, our, yeah, let's think about throwing up four coins. You can throw four coins and uh, it could go head, tails, head, tails, right? Or you could get three heads and one tail, or you could get one head and three tails. There's all these different macro states that you could uh, assume. For instance, four heads, head, 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 head. That that would be a macro state. Uh the number of ways that can be done are called the microstates. So for instance, if you wanted uh, to do coins, let's, let's try that. What I do when I'm counting uh, outcomes is I treat it like an odometer. So I'm going to have a four blank situation like I'm showing here. And the options are head or tail. So what you can do is you can start with the lower one. So I'm going to pretend like tail is zero and head is one, something like that. In which case, I start with the lower one and I'm going to put them all in the lower state. So I'm going to say tail, 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 tail. That's the one way you can have four tails as a macro state, okay? Meaning this is literally the only way. So you only got one micro state that is equivalent to the macro state of four tails. Now I'm going to treat this other guy like a uh, odometer or something like that. So the very rightmost one, which would be the lowest digit, if you think of this as a number like 4,321, the one would be in the ones place. So this T is going to go from T to H to T to H to T to H. And I, I'll do a couple extras because I'm really not sure at any particular point how many I need, but I can figure that out uh, as I go. So uh, each time you exhaust all the resources of one column, then you got to switch the other column. So I went tail and head. Uh, so that second one stays tail there. But when I go to the third case, I'm starting another cycle on the leftmost one. So that one's going to have to come head and then head again. But now it's changed again. So I'm going to say tail and tail again and head and head again and tail and tail again, 
Now I can do the same thing for the third row. And this one's going to be tail, tail. Uh, notice I don't start over again until I get to the tail, tail. So this is tail, 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 and then head, 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 head. I'm suspecting that that's going to be the number that I need. So I'll stop right there. Uh, but now we can do the next one. Actually, it might not be the next one. So uh, I could do tail, tail, tail. Actually, this one's supposed to be head here. And this one's supposed to be tail here. And this one's supposed to be head here. And this one's supposed to be head there. So this one could be tail, tail like that. And then again, this guy's going to be tail, 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 tail. And then I can start head, 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 head. And you see basically this first one, uh, the rightmost column had uh, basically tail, head, tail, head, tail, head. Every, every two options, it flipped. The second one, every uh, four options, it flips. So tail, tail, head, head, flip again. Tail, tail, head, head, flip again. The next one had like eight. Tail, 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 head, 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 head. So this one's got to have 16. So I got tail, 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 tail. That's uh, tail. That's eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this one should have like that. Uh, and if you continue on with this, you get tail, head, tail, head. Uh, if you continue on with this, you get tail, tail, head, head. And with this one, you get three tails, four tails, one, two, three, four heads, four tails, and then one, two, three, four heads. So that's all the possible outcomes. Notice I did finally get a head, 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 head. So I actually got one of those uh, ways to get four heads. Whereas if I need uh, three heads, I can see that this is a three head scenario. Uh, this is a three head scenario. And I think that's it. So I've got two micro macro state micro states that equate to the macro state of three heads. So that's sort of what we're talking about with this stuff. And when this comes into play, crap, I ran over six minutes. Let me just read this last version of the second law of thermodynamics. The total entropy of any system plus that of its environment increases as a result of any natural process. So the whole environment is what matters. Uh, do take the time to read about uh, biological development, order, and disorder, uh, just so you'll be knowledgeable so that you uh, can uh, register, you know, BS claims. A lot of people, a lot of people sometimes will use the second law of thermodynamics to say it's a violation of something that they believe in is a violation of science. Uh, so this explains how that uh, is not accurately uh, portraying the second law of thermodynamics. So yes, disorder increases with the second law of thermodynamics, but you can have, for instance, order developing at least to some system where the net entropy of the universe is increasing. So we're done with chapter 20. I've talked to you about all the stuff you should be able to uh, do. We're not going to, I'm not going to make you do any, any calculations with that S equals K Lin W, but I do want you to read it and understand it and know that that's yet another version or another definition of uh, entropy. So you guys are free to go. I'm not going to leave till the last person does so, but feel free to stick around and ask questions. And you guys have a good weekend. Remember, you do have a test Tuesday. I'll make a practice test for you. Uh, you're already ready for it, to be honest with you, but uh, just go for it. Excuse me, Professor? That yes. test on Tuesday, is it going to mm -hmm. be, uh, like, do I need to bring my laptop? So uh, I normally do make it a Canvas test, but it's not. It's one where you have to have the lockdown browser because you're not allowed to search the internet or anything like that. You're not allowed to have a phone, you're not allowed to open books or open notes. The only thing you're allowed is uh, basically equation sheets. 
And I don't, I don't have a limit on the number of equation sheets, but I do have a limit where you're only allowed equations that are marked with the parenthesis, chapter number, dash, and a number. So if it's in your textbook and it has a parenthesis with a chapter number next to it, and then uh, equation number next to it, then that equation is okay to be on the sheet. So uh, by doing that, you'll get your grade uh, as soon as you finish. So yes, if you have a computer that can use the TCC Wi-Fi, can run Canvas and can run Canvas tests and can run Respondus Lockdown Browser, it would be a great help if you bring your laptop. If you don't want to, that's okay. Uh, we can cycle you in and out with the computers that we do have. Uh, and I think we actually have enough for this class because this class is kind of small. But if you have one, that's great. Bring it. But like I said, you're just not allowed to do any searches like you do with the online tests. I got you. So I still have to use Respondus even in class? Yeah, just because uh, last semester I discovered some people were still uh, surfing the web and doing Google searches during the test. Uh, even when we were watching them. So they were just sort of quickly flipping back and forth between tabs and the screen. So I've got to lock that down to keep that from happening. Oh, I got you. I thought that's what the Respondus was for. But... Yeah, the Respondus Lockdown Browser. There's a Respondus Monitor and there's Respondus Lockdown Browser. I use the Lockdown Browser so that my lab teacher can just, you know, keep an eye that you're not cheating, but also not have to walk by and look at your computer every five seconds. <laughs> So uh, at least that way, it's a little bit easier for us to make sure you're doing uh, doing things on the up and up. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got you. All right, thanks, Randall. Yeah, thank you. Have a good Itali weekend. You have a good one. Have a nice weekend. Yatal, do you have anything, bud? Uh, yes, sir, but it's a more personal question. Uh, if Randall okay. wants to ask you something. Do you want me to stop share, uh, Stop recording? Oh, no, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not a big deal. It's just, I, I was hoping to ask you if, uh, you're going to be in an office tomorrow. If not, uh, I can ask right now. No, I won't be in the office tomorrow. Okay, I'll, I'll start now. Uh, would you mind writing me a Virginia Tech letter of recommendation? Oh, absolutely, transfer? yeah. Um, so I think they just request an email from me, and then I'll shoot them your school email if that's okay, and then uh, yeah. they'll send you something along those lines. That's cool. I'll keep an eye out on it. I've got another student that uh, is getting one from the, a student that I had last semester. He had to come back and give me a note because evidently I didn't see his email. So, yeah, if you don't hear from me, you've got my, my personal cell phone number. So make sure you text me and, and let me know. Hey, I need help. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll right. see you in class next week. All right. Thank you, Vital. Have a good one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.